Good morning. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder, during the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was preaching, when they got to about Matthew chapter 7, you think someone said, are we like that today? It's very funny, as a pastor, I'm trying to meet people where they are. I'm assuming that a lot of people are coming into the church who maybe they don't know Jesus. So we try to maintain cultural norms, and one of them is, eh, you want to keep the sermon around an hour. I think that's the cultural expectation. But really mature Christians are like, no, we want to worship for two hours and then have Bible study. So on Wednesday nights, that's kind of what we do. We don't worship for that long, but we have an extended time of worship. I talk and talk and talk and talk about the Bible for a long time. That's what I like to do. But we have to remember there are a lot of people who don't know Jesus yet. They don't know anything about the Bible. So we have to kind of like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I can be all things for the sake of the gospel. And so I just want to take a minute. Yeah, the service might go like two minutes long today, so if you're new, don't worry. It doesn't happen all the time that I just speak off the cuff. But I want to take a minute because quite often, we used to say this in martial arts, don't forget what it's like to be a white belt. That's really important. A lot of teachers forget what it's like to be a white belt. A lot of pastors forget what it's like not to know Jesus. And so sometimes I'll make fun of stuff. Right? Like the coffee or different things like that. But we have to remember there are a lot of people that just don't get it yet. And so I just want to take a moment to thank those who serve, who are participating here, and welcome you all to join us in that. So I don't know what happened with the coffee because I was upstairs praying and getting changed, but I just want to thank the people who took the effort, who get it, who understand, hey, we really want there to be coffee because that's a cultural norm. And it might be inviting to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. They come here and they say, oh, they were really nice people. Because we're all not going to get it just yet. And there are a lot of belts to go through if we're being honest, right? So thank you for those who serve. You guys are really, really awesome. We care about you. And we feel loved. And I hope you guys feel loved when you came in this morning. So I'm excited to be continuing in this series, the rest of the story. What's kind of funny about it is we're finding ourselves arriving in the fourth book of the Bible this morning, but we've been at it for a while, which should be telling you that this is a really long story, but I like long stories. We'll be breaking it up in a couple of weeks. We'll be doing some standalones here and there just to kind of break things up a little bit. Sometimes I like short stories, and when I think of short stories, I think of O. Henry. I like O. Henry. Now, there are a lot of young people here who are like, say, what? Who's O. Henry? Because O. Henry wrote his stories over 100 years ago. But back when I was in school 100 years ago, we read, <laughs> it feels like that, we read O. Henry stories. And I liked them because they were ironic. 
and not ironic in an Alanis Morissette kind of way, where absolutely nothing about, see, now you get that, about the song is ironic. No, O. Henry was a master of irony. One of my favorite O. Henry stories is called The Cop and the Anthem. I'm gonna modify it slightly, and I'm gonna shorten the short story for you. It has a lot of old words, old language in it. But I'm not gonna change a few things, like the guy's name, Soapy. Now, if I get through this without mixing up Sophie and Soapy, my daughter's name is Sophie, I should get a prize, one small piece of candy, standard prize here at C3 Church. Anyway, Soapy, has an ironic name because Soapy is a person who is experiencing homelessness. And he's not experiencing homelessness the way we would here in Southwest Florida. It's in New York. And I can relate to that because I have experienced homelessness in New York. But I had it a lot better than Soapy. I had options. I could sleep on a friend's couch maybe in a car, but I can relate to this. Right around the winter time, you start to get a little nervous because it's gonna get cold. And that's what's going on with Soapy. He calls home a park bench, notices the leaves changing and falling, and he knows that the newspapers that he calls blankets are not gonna cut it for the winter months. So he begins to devise a strategy. He comes up with this. I will do something just bad enough to get me thrown in jail for the winter months. Don't get any ideas, guys. Okay? This, I'm not, this is not a suggestion. We're going to talk, Phil. All right. <laughs> Got to pick on Phil. Anyway, <laughs> not a suggestion, but this is his strategy, and I'm going to tell you why you should not take this strategy. So he goes about doing things to get himself arrested. He tries to go into a fancy restaurant, they just kick him out. He finally gets into a fancy restaurant, he eats, doesn't pay the bill, they just throw him out. <laughs> so he flirts with a woman back then, that would be a big no-no. She likes it. He steals an umbrella, the guy lets him have it. He pretends like he's intoxicated. Don't try that either. He pretends like he's intoxicated, it doesn't work. The cop just thinks, ah. Eh. He's some frat kid or something like that celebrating a victory. Nothing works. He can't get himself arrested. Well, he finds himself walking along. He passes by a church. He hears the church music. It inspires him. So he starts thinking, you know, maybe I'll try something different. Maybe I'll try to get a job, clean up a little bit, get back to work and change my life. Yeah, you know what? I think I'll do that tomorrow. And as he's standing there on the outside looking in, someone taps him on the shoulder. Sure enough, it's a cop. The cop asks him, what are you doing? Nothing. Mm, you're doing something, he says. You're loitering. So he arrests him and he takes him in. The next day, he gets sentenced to three months in prison. That's ironic, don't you think? <laughs> so, Soapy gets his three months of shelter. Today, I'm going to be your tour guide as we wander with the Israelites through the book of Numbers. I'm going to give you an overview, stopping like a good tour guide at key points pointing certain things out in the rest of this story. So I told you, we've been jumping around quite a bit. I'm doing things topically, not straight through, so that you guys can connect these things a little better. It's all about connecting the dots. So last week, we were in the book of Leviticus. We picked up, actually, in Exodus 35, finished it up. The week before that, we were dealing with, what, the Ten Commandments? Remember that? So we're going to go back to Exodus, even though we find ourselves in numbers, because we're dealing with the things as it pertains to Israel's wanderings. They're wandering around the wilderness. But that begins right after the Passover. So if you remember, they passed over on dry ground. The Red Sea was parted for them. 
And then the Egyptians are in hot pursuit. The sea closes in on them. But they begin wandering and certain things start happening. And I want to cover some of those things for you. One thing I want to point out, I want you to notice, is right away, before they part, they go across the Red Sea, before the Egyptians are defeated by the Lord, baptized, so to speak, in the water, they immediately start complaining. They're worried. They say things like, we want to go back to Egypt immediately. And so this is going to be a theme I want you to pay attention to. After that, we get to chapter 15. Something interesting. Moses sings a song. We're going to see that Moses sometimes is a psalmist. Kind of interesting. There's a psalm by him. He sings a song of deliverance. And at the end of that song, somebody else joins him. Somebody else sings a song. Do you remember Miriam? Back in Exodus. This is his older sister that observed him floating down as a baby down the river. And she hatched a clever plan to get him back into the arms of his mother. Do you need a nursemaid? I got one, his mom. Remember Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, and the servants find them. Well, this is Miriam, and she's much older. And she sings this, Exodus 15, verse 20. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine and led all the women as they played their tambourines and danced. And Miriam sang this song, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. So she's singing about what just happened. And one interesting thing to think about for a second, this is the one of a few examples that we'll see in the rest of the story of a woman dictating scripture. Think about it. Most Christians would say, yes, Exodus 15, 20, 21, that's scripture. Yeah, well, Miriam dictated it. She sang it. Kind of interesting. Then we get the account of the bitter water, Mara. That's a word you want to pay attention to as you're reading through the Old Testament. Kind of interesting. It'll come up again today. Basically, there's water, but it's too bitter to drink. So the Lord points out a piece of wood. Moses throws it in the water, and we have our first water filtration system in history. They can then drink the water, but... This theme again picks up of complaining, Exodus 16. <laughs> if the Lord had only just killed us in Egypt, the complaining is that bad, it's that off the hook, despite the miracles, almost immediately. We're only talking about a couple of months later. But here's what happens. The Lord says, ah, I'll feed you. Stop complaining. So at first we see quail in the evening. He provides for them, but then manna. Every morning. So here's the basic concept. It's that they're to rely on the Lord's provision. In the morning, it shows up. A flaky substance like coriander seed. Don't worry if you don't know what that is. I didn't either. I had to look it up a while back. It's basically white. It tastes like honeycomb. And the idea here is that they are to pick up about two quarts. They take it for that day. And that's it. If they take too much, it rots. It has maggots in it and it smells. The idea is that you have to trust that the Lord will provide for you each morning, except on the sixth day. You take twice as much because on the seventh day, they're not supposed to work. Again, relying on the Lord's provision. But like many today, they decide not to take the Lord's gift for them. They worked. They went out and tried to get it, but it wasn't there for them. The Lord says this, Exodus 16, 28. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day. So there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. Exodus 17, more complaining constantly. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? We want to go back. So they're thirsty now. This is the complaint. So the Lord tells Moses, see that rock over there? Strike the rock with your staff and water will come out. 
And it does. Again, the Lord provides. But that place is called Masaba, Masa, test or Meribah. Arguing has two names. Remember that name. When we get to the end of Exodus 17, we notice that there's a theme of Moses needing help kind of interesting. And most don't put the two stories together. They're told separately, but I think they're intentionally put together. Remember, there are no chapter numbers in these original versions. First, we have the battle with the Amalekites. If you remember Joshua, Moses' assistant, he can go up the mountain a little bit with Moses to a certain degree. Well, Joshua is leading the Israelites in a battle against the Amalekites. And Moses, he's on a hill nearby. And whenever Moses raises his staff up, they prevail. They win. He's old. His arm, he gets tired. His arms come down. They start losing. So Aaron and her, remember them, they get him a nice comfy rock to sit on. And so he sits down, and they're on either side of him helping him, helping Moses with his hands. Then we see another character we've talked about recently. His father-in-law, Jethro, shows up on the scene for a visit. They catch up, they worship together, but Jethro observes something. Moses, you're doing everything yourself. That's not good. Gives him a basic idea. Why don't you get other people to judge over the smaller matters and help you out? Basically, you're going to burn out. You learn this story in pastor school. That's how they teach you to get help, involve other people, do discipleship, let other people make the coffee, not just you, pastor. So that's the idea there. Now we get to the Ten Commandments, 19, the initiation of it, and chapter 20. So we did that part of Exodus, and I told you guys about the timeline. If we're looking at Exodus 12, the Passover account, and we go all the way through the book of Exodus, through Leviticus, into Numbers to chapter 9, one year. But then it's going to slow down. Different timeline. So here we are at the book of Numbers. And this is another book where a lot of people quit. Let's be honest, how many of you have quit at Numbers? Why? Because it's just a lot of names. Names and names and names that you can't pronounce. You don't understand what's going on. So I'll overview it for you. Or if you'd like, I can just read you all the names. <laughs> I'll be here for a long time. A lot of you who know him, you're getting nervous. My wife is like, <laughs> don't dare him. Anyway, I'll overview it. Basically, it's the registration of the people. That's why it's called Numbers. And so chapter 1, registration of the troop, troops. Chapter 2, division of the tribes. Uh, then you get the Levites, 3 and 4. If you don't know what Levites are, they're kind of people who help in the worship service. They're not all priests necessarily. They don't all perform that function like Aaron and his descendants. Some of them just help out with the worship. Some of them are singers. So in a modern context, a Levite would be anybody who helps out with the worship service. So you're a Levite, Robert, David, Levite. Grace is a Levite. Right? So, so anyone who's assisting in the worship that's a Levite, and so they're registered. Then, I'm going to stop the tour bus at chapter 5 and point out something really funny that I think is funny that the women in here will not think is funny at all. It's something I like to call the jealousy test. First time I read this, I had to laugh at the end. So what happens is, if a guy is jealous or he suspects his wife is cheating on him, he could take her to the priest I'll make this short. The priest makes her drink bitter water. And if her thigh shrivels, <laughs> that sounds weird, but this region, they just refer to it as thigh sometimes. So remember, the servant of Abraham, he makes him put his hand under his thigh. <laughs> Interesting. It shrivels up and her abdomen swells. She's guilty. And so some versions say womb shrivels. But if it doesn't, she's all right. Here's the thing. <laughs> At the end of it, it said, well, if the husband was wrong, he's good. He hasn't sinned. Aren't you glad we're not under the law, ladies, of Moses? There's no punishment for being wrong there. And I always found that very curious. So I know you're glad that doesn't exist, and so am I. Because the last thing I need is all you guys bringing your women in, saying, all right, get the bitter water, pastor. <laughs> Feeling a little jealous. 
No, give me her smartphone. I'll tell you what she's doing. (laughs) (laughs) Then you get chapter 6 through 8. We're getting there. You get more laws, things about the offerings. Numbers 9. Ah, the second Passover. That is a yearly festival. There are three mandatory festivals. This is one of them. This is how we know. Exodus 12 to Numbers 9 is one year. That's a lot of reading in one year, isn't it? Now they'll begin to wander away from Sinai. Numbers 9, starting at verse 15. On the day the tabernacle, so that was that set up church, this portable temple that they have now, was set up, the cloud covered it. But from the evening until morning, the cloud over the tabernacle looked like a pillar of fire. This was the regular pattern. At night, the cloud that covered the tabernacle had the appearance of fire. Whenever the cloud from over the sacred tent lifted from over the sacred tent, the people of Israel would break camp and follow it. And whenever the cloud settled, the people of Israel would set up camp. In this way, they traveled and camped at the Lord's command, wherever he told them to go. So now they leave Sinai, Numbers 10, starting at verse 11. In the second year after Israel's departure from Egypt, on the 20th day of the second month, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the covenant. So the Israelites set out from the wilderness of Sinai and traveled on from place to place until the cloud stopped in the wilderness of Paran. We get to Numbers 11, and this is quite interesting to me. There's more of the complaining. That is not what is interesting. But they're complaining about the manna. We had meat to eat in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here? They're complaining so much that Moses now wants to give up. He actually says, kill me, Lord. So like, this is like a pastor on his worst day. Like, Just take me home to be with you, Lord. That's it. So this is where Moses is at, right? They're complaining. You guys aren't that bad. It's just the coffee, not the meat. Anyway, (laughs) something very interesting happens. Again, the theme of needing help. Remember the 70 elders. They go up the mountain a little bit and have a covenant meal with the Lord. Ah, they appear again. Remember Bezalel who is filled with the Holy Spirit. So not like Acts, where there's this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. No, it's selective. Bezalel. Now, the 70 elders are filled with the Spirit. They prophesy, empowered to help Moses out. Some of the Spirit that is on Moses is now on them. Theme of getting help. Something really interesting happens, though. There are two, Eldad and Medad, I believe, and they are not with them necessarily, but they're still filled with the Spirit. Freaks some kids out, including Joshua. Joshua goes and tells Moses about it. Moses is like, I wish everybody could be filled with the Spirit. But now the complaint is answered. God basically says, you want meat? I'll give you meat. You're going to choke on it. He's really upset. So like, you want coffee? I'll give you coffee. No. <laughs> so the Lord tells the people this. He says to Moses, And say to the people, Purify yourselves, for tomorrow you will have meat to eat. You were whining, and the Lord heard you when you cried, Oh, for some meat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you have to eat it. And it won't just be for a day or two, or for five or ten or even twenty. You will eat it. For a whole month until you gag and are sick of it. For you have rejected the Lord who is here among you. And you have whined to him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses responded to the Lord, there are 600,000 foot soldiers here with me. And yet you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Even if we butchered all our flocks and herds, would that satisfy them? Even if we caught all the fish in the sea, would that be enough? Then the Lord said to Moses, has my arm lost its power? Now you will see whether or not my word comes true. So they get the quail. A wind comes in. They're flying around about three feet off the ground. They collect it. They start eating it. And while it's still in their mouths, they get stricken with a plague. Complaining, complaining, complaining. They're not satisfied, not pleased with the Lord's provision. This is the theme. Even Aaron and Miriam complain. 
Moses marries somebody, see, like this is how families are, that they don't like, apparently. She's a Cushite woman, not good enough for Moses. They complain about that. <laughs> he strikes Miriam with a plague. This is his sister. And she has to stay outside the camp for seven days. Now we get to Numbers 13. We're going to hang here for just a little bit. They finally get to the promised land. Here we are. We've been taken out of Egypt, land flowing with milk and honey. Yay! So they send out 12 scouts to spy out the land, scout it out, tell us about what you see there. And so they do. One from each one of the 12 tribes of Israel, a representative to go. They scout it out. They notice that indeed it is a beautiful land. It has pomegranates and figs and big clusters of grapes, so big that it takes two of them to carry them. So the place is called Eshkol, which means cluster. And so they bring everything back. But here's the thing. They also see giants, descendants of Anak. And so they give a bad report, 10 of them anyway. They say, we're like grasshoppers to them. And they thought the same thing. We're going to get killed again, not trusting in the Lord's provision. Did they forget that the sea was parted for them? God's going to take care of it, but they don't believe it. They give a really bad report, except Caleb and Joshua. We're going to read more about them. But again, we want to go back. We need a new leader. Let's go back to Egypt. We're done. Haven't you seen what the Lord has done for you? So now, the Lord is really upset. And he says, everybody 20 years old and older will die in this wilderness. I'm done. It's a similar thing to the golden calf account. Do you remember that? It's almost the same exact language. They made the golden calf. The Lord now wants to destroy them completely. And he tells Moses, I will make you a great nation. We're going to wipe these people out, basically, and start over again. Moses intercedes in almost the same way. He says, basically, the Egyptians are going to make fun of you, like you failed and your people have failed. So the Lord relents. But he says this, Numbers 14, 34, because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander the wilderness for 40 years a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sins. Then you will discover what it is like to have me for an enemy. Consequences. But now, they change their mind. Apparently, this upsets them a little bit. They feel sorry, and they go and try to go into the land, but they get chased out by the Amalekites and the Canaanites. It is too little, too late. To summarize, we're going to hop over to Numbers 20, but 15 through 19, talk about it at Bible study if you like. You get the story of Korah's rebellion. There's more rebellion. That's a fairly popular story. I want to hop to Numbers 20 because here we see we're back at a familiar place. It is said that now, from the second Passover to here, it is 37 to 40 years. There's some debate about it, but I think that's about it. So it's a fairly long period of time that goes by. Miriam dies. The theme, we want to go back. But they're already back at the rock. Remember Meribah? They find themselves back there. And this is an account that took me a little while to understand, if I'm being honest. Sometimes the Bible stories can be hard to understand. But here we come full circle, all the way back at Meribah. They want water. Maybe Moses forgot. <laughs> it's been 40 years or so. But the Lord says this, Moses, speak to the rock. He doesn't strikes it twice, and water comes out. But there's a little text in there that you should pay attention to. Remember, the people are complaining, complaining, complaining. Moses is very frustrated. And so when you read it appropriately, he says something kind of interesting. Must we bring water from the rock? 
So when you visualize it, he's taking credit for it. So it's probably like they're complaining, they're complaining, complaining. Must we bring you water from the rock like that? Two times, though. I did it three because I get really mad anyway. He strikes it in anger. He takes credit for it. Why? Well, remember, he said, Lord, kill me. I'm done with these people. He doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Well, now the Lord says, you, Moses, will now not get into the land either. You're going to die here too in the wilderness. Did you know that in the New Testament, people also have issues with meat? Kind of like the Israelites did, but different. I'll explain it quickly. You have to view Christianity in the beginning, in the Gospels, when you read the Gospels. They're mostly all Jewish people that Jesus is dealing with. You have a few instances where it's not. But for the most part, they're all Jewish. In Acts, they're Jewish. It takes them until chapter 10 to figure out, in Peter's vision, that you can let the Gentiles in now. It takes them a while. So it's a Jewish religion, a Jewish faith. So naturally, they're going to ask the question, do the Gentiles need to become Jewish like Jesus, like the apostles? Natural. We get to Acts chapter 15. We have one of the church, first church councils, and they decide no. But they have to follow four simple rules. One of them is not eating meat, sacrificed to idols. Big one. Comes up a couple times in the New Testament. So they're arguing about it. 1 Corinthians, basic context. That's what it is. 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Everything's said in there. You've got to have in your mind this thing about meat sacrificed to idols. They're squabbling over it. They're fighting and arguing. And Paul's coming in to say, Ugh, it's not gospel. Yes, I know it's a church rule, but it's not gospel. So if someone wants to do it, great. Leave them alone. Don't argue about it. But within that context, Paul talks about what we learned today. 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 1. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about your ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank, drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock, was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. So that's the golden calf account. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did. And then they died from snake bites. We'll see that next week. Don't grumble as some of them did. And then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Christ is our spiritual rock. We build our faith on his foundation. Christ is also our shelter, three festivals, booths, Passover, Pentecost, and booths, tabernacles or shelters, Sukkoth. The Jewish people still celebrate it today. It's when they remember the Lord's provision, how he provided for them in the wilderness for 40 years. So they still sometimes go out and stay in tents as they celebrate this to remember what the Lord did for them. But now, Christ has fulfilled this. He is our shelter. He is our covering. He is our protection. He is our provision. The Israelites wanted to go back from where they came. 
They weren't satisfied with the shelter or the provision of the Lord. Instead, they desired to go back to their imprisonment. Soapy wanted to seek shelter by getting himself put in prison through imprisonment. But then he reached a point where he was provided an escape by the church. He heard the provision. He saw the provision calling to him from the church. But he was on the outside looking in. Like Soapy, we can't get caught on the outside looking in. It isn't enough to be inspired for a moment by the music, inspired by the preaching. If we stay in the wrong spot, if it doesn't motivate us to participate in the provision. There is a time when it's too little, too late. As Paul wrote, these things were written as examples for us, to warn us. They weren't pleased with the provision. Well, then they changed their mind only after being faced with a punishment. But it was too little, too late. You see, it's not enough to do nothing. It's not enough to simply contemplate or put it off for another day. We sometimes become complacent in our contemplations. Perhaps the spot we're in hasn't affected us yet. You're eligible too. What seems convenient can enslave us sometimes. We can find ourselves caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. We can contemplate about perhaps going back the way we came, like the Israelites wanted to. But you must remember that the grass was not greener in the past, like the Israelites in the Promised Land. We shouldn't desire to go back, perhaps out of fear, perhaps out of worldly desires. We must trust that Christ is our provision. We must trust that God will provide. Those of us in ministry understand this. In the beginning, I didn't trust that he would provide. I don't want to be a pastor. Are you kidding? I see what they do. It doesn't look fun. But I had to trust that he would provide. And he has. It's fine. So that's my encouragement to you today as we come full circle in our application. There's a place for you here. We are the body of Christ. All of us. We are all members of it. You're all very, very important here. And so if you're not serving, you haven't found your place, reach out to me. Carly, I think you're doing the announcements today, so you'll see her. She's nicer than me. <laughs> Go talk to her. <laughs> talk to one of us. Get in service. Sometimes that's the best way to get out of your own head. Service. You are all an important part of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians as well, Paul talks about that. You get to chapter 12. He does kind of, as Heather said, the puppet show. It's prosopopeci. I said that wrong, I'm sure. I will hear about it later from my Greek teacher. Anyway, to make a face. I know I got that part right. It's a literary device, something rhetorical that Paul is doing. So he's got different body parts talking to one another and they're saying, well, I'm just a foot or I'm just a hand. I'm not important. Yes, you are. Opposable thumbs. It's what makes us different from the animals. <laughs> Try taping your thumb to the rest of your hand and doing life like that for a while. Looks insignificant, but it's very important. Everything. 
is important in the body of Christ. You matter. Let me pray for you. Lord, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I pray we press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Lord, you are calling to each one of us. And so I pray that everyone here answers that call, surrenders what's weighing them down. I pray that they look forward, not back, to the prize in Jesus Christ, to their godly and heavenly calling. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.